Hi guys, welcome back to the latest episode of Box Chatter, the 40k podcast that's all things Games Workshop and 40k related. I'm back as usual, Count Hillary, and I have got with me today, Brett. Hello. Just me and Brett again today, but we've still got plenty to talk about, and um, first of all, I'm pleased to say that we've actually started getting a more regular schedule going now with this podcast. So... Moving forward, um, it will be at least a once a month feature. So this is uh, December's episode and we will be another one in the new year. So uh, keep an eye out for that. So we've got a few things we're going to talk about tonight, but our main topic is around the newest, uh, the newest phenomenon in 8th edition 40k, which is the Alpha Strike. And no, it's not new. It's just new to all my eyes. Yeah, but that's what I mean. It's 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 more a it's a game defining thing now rather than just you know like a drop podding space marines or similar. Yeah. So the the whole point is the concept of the alpha strike. Is it too strong or is it too defining of the game now, or not? Is it a brilliant new thing they brought in and it actually speeds the game up a lot? There's uh, plenty to discuss. So, <laughs> out of the gate, um, what do you reckon, Brett? What do you? What's your opinion on the Alpha Strike? I mean, I'm I'm an Alpha Strike player. Um, I've probably got more Alpha Strike. I mean, I played Tau, uh, Battle Suits. I've always loved Tau Battle Suits, um, and I had Drop Pods when I played Marines comes the new edition where you can again do lots of alpha striking I think the power level of it is massive now I've just gone back to my played a bit of Tau, gone back to Space Marines um, and I'm enjoying playing them but they don't want drop pods anymore because as everybody will know drop pods aren't worth it uh, to be fair though I'm, I'm a big advocate of the change to drop pods because the, yeah, there were the common staple thing of every army. Oh, it plays marines. How many drop pods you playing? It wasn't have you got. It was how many have you got. And the thing that I just didn't get with it was they played deep strikes so differently to any other army. Like go where you want. Yeah, I, I I've played demons since back in the day when the army as a whole used to turn up and deep strike. Didn't change the fact you still had to abide by distance. Uh, well, abide by mishaps and difficulties and all the rest of it. The drop pod was stupid. So I always felt it was basically the same points for a rhino guaranteed turn one deep strike and all that. Market. The uh, guidance system in the drop pod honestly felt like cheating within the rules to me. <laughs> That's what it always felt like. Well, but yeah, I mean, alpha strike at the minute is super super powerful. You turn up, you don't scatter, you don't do anything. You're just nine inches away from your opponent, so, so you get to rapid fire all your. Uh, a lot of your guns, a lot of the armies get to rapid fire. Skion's down, I know, but if you take like a Skion command squad with plasma guns, then you're rapid firing all them. Or if you take melter guns, you're shooting all their tanks if they leave them unprotected. The one thing I will say that I am pleased, though, that they thought about is the fact that the majority of flamer weapons are out of range when you arrive via deep strike, as it were. Um, which... Just as a heads up, you know, we'll, we will no doubt be referring to it regularly as deep striking as, you know, long-time players of the hobby. So, although it's not the technical term anymore. Um, yeah, every, I think every army has its own... New variety of deep strike. Like teleportation strike or manta strike for the tower. Oh, descent. Or... <laughs> I think the, the Necron monolith I is like in high got... orbit or something. Yeah, it yeah, like yeah, drops in. everything's got a different... Narrative reason. Narrative reason. I think the majority of it might be high orbit though. Which is why demons don't get anything, because they don't have anything that narratively is why they appear out of nowhere. Other than the fact they rip a hole in the fabric of reality and step through it. But, yeah, but at least you're getting your book soon, so that'll um, clear that up. Yeah, I hope so. I really hope so. I mean, like you suggested, uh, uh, I'm just hoping at least things like the Blood First Turn and all the change will get it, because they have wings. Practically everything in addition now as the ability to deep strike if it has wings. We've seen it with the um, Tyranid Hive Tyrant in their new codex. 
Don't get me started on them. <laughs> well, no, let's let's get you started on them. That's the point. So, the new Tyranid uh, Hive Tyrant being able to deep strike if it's got wings. Is gay. <laughs> but is it something that's too good, or is it something that's needed? Because it's it's not the Nid itself. It's not the Hive Tyrant that's the overly powerful thing as such. See, I'm not a Tyranid player, but that's why we could really do J with James. He's played Tyranids... Um, For years, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And... Like, the Flying Hive Tyrant itself might not be the thing that's stupidly overpowered. Everything. Yeah, but... It does everything. It comes down. It goes, right, what do I want to do in my movement phase? So I don't want to be shot at because I've got 12 wounds where I can be targeted. So I'll avoid being shot at by taking wings and going in deep strike. So that, first so of all... That gives me the fly keyword. But that, that's true of anything with fly. And anything that's capable of deep striking that way. That's not literally the fact it's a hive tyrant. So that's right, okay, that's so, that, so that's we'll the start, game so we'll rules. The, it's movement, it's deployment, it cannot even it can choose to not deploy on the board or deploy on the board. Then you go to the movement phase, it has a really quick movement because it has wings. Yeah. And it can move out of combat and shoot because it has fly. Then you go to the next phase of the game, which is shooting uh psychic, sorry. Then it smites you, and then does some other, like, it can either do the other mortal wound damaging spells, or the ones where it gives itself feel no pain, effectively the, um, I what it's called now. Uh, catalyst? Think, yeah. yeah, Catalyst. And it can give you minus to hit, or strike less in, com last in combat always. So therefore it has a potent psychic phase. Then it you give it twin guns. Then it shoots you in the shooting phase with good guns because it, it's like the like strength six, um, and then you go to the combat phase, and it can charge you. But again, that's a game rule. Yeah, so that, that's yeah, what we're talking that's a game about. Rule. So then it can charge you. Then it gets into combat and it's got like re-rolling ones to hit and wound or something like that, depending on what you give it. And then it's got. Five or six attacks, like I said, I'm not the nid player. Um, with minus two to your armor, D, uh, damage three. Right, so it massacres you in combat. Um, and if it doesn't, it can fly off next turn. And then you get to the morale phase at the very end of the turn, and it's got sign up, so it just stops all that little crap that you're shooting from dying. It literally does everything in every phase of the game. However, if that thing was not capable of deploying nine inches away from you on the first turn, even if it winged hive tyrant did everything else, fly keywords still look the same, but it had to deploy in the deployment zone with the army. It wouldn't half strike you. Yes. But does that how much does that reduce the impact of that hive tyrant? Um, quite a lot. And especially when you're uh Friends rocking three of them, it's... <laughs> yeah, in case you haven't guessed, uh, Brett may have been on the receiving end of several Hive Tyrants recently, and uh, he's not a fan of them. Well, I was always the Alpha Strike player, and now I knew why people don't like being Alpha Strike. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I enjoy it. I, you know, it, it, it's a legitimate tactic. It is. Turn up, blow away the opponent, you know. It just very much, at the minute, seems like you have to build your army in one of two ways. Am I alpha striking? No. Therefore, I need to be prepared to be alpha struck. So you need to either have... And even with two alpha strike armies, you know, it tends to be the person... Whoever goes first gets alpha struck because you can both hold all your dirty units in reserve. But all that happens is... They have to put theirs down because they're there to three yeah, for you. Everything starts happening on turn three rather than turn one. But otherwise the little things that were on the ground were just exchanging fire in the meantime. Yeah. Um, or the first person brings all their stuff down, wipes out all the little stuff or tries to table the opponent depending on how much goes in reserve. Or then you get the two armies that um, are prepared to be alpha struck, so your two grindy armies, and they actually then just play out a good game. Like you mentioned briefly about how you build your army, either one way or the other. Now I think that is the I think that's the biggest key thing here is 
you either have player A who builds their army with the intention of get as much into the alpha strike as they can. You know, you get as much force down on the, t on the table in your turn one without being harmed and blowing the opponent away with, you know, firepower or combat or whatever. Then you have the player B who might have built their list to be anti-alpha strike. Now, it might not be that they're trying to penalise the opponent for doing it, but perhaps they're just mitigating, mitigating the damage. damage they're suffering, yes. Now... I do that with my guard. Ever since I even looked at the index for them in this edition, the star standout unit for me was Scout Sentinels. Just the fact that before the game, they get to move that nine inches away from your deployment zone sets up uh, area denial. It just sets up bubbles of 18 inches uh, outside your line that the enemy can't drop in, or the only thing they can drop on is those Sentinels. True. Crew. You do the same thing, and you can take one big squad of crew put a big bubble around your army, and even if you don't go first, they just walk seven inches forward and push your opponent really far away. So then when they, you've got a seven inch gap between the stuff behind your crew and your crew, then the opponent has to appear nine inches away from the crew. So realistically, they're looking at being like 18 inches away from anything that's not crew. Now, while examples such as Crute and Scout Sentinels still prove to be useful units for your army, you know, they do their job, they go get objectives, they cause a nuisance. And they're cheap. They're cheap. My Sentinels come in like Las Cannons, yeah, they've still got the capacity to do things. That feels okay. You're like, yep, yeah, it's a legitimate, you know, army structure tactic to take those units, and they, they feel like they fulfill a battlefield role. However, then you get things such as my Demon Army. One of the, basically, the most essential purchase in my list, no matter what I'm wanting to do, is the unit of Nurglings. Every single demon army I play with now has to include that unit of Nurglings. Because I need them for their infiltrate ability, so that I can deny a flank getting alpha struck. Because I have no other way of doing it. There's no other units that allow me to hold back in reserve, uh, alpha strike myself, or that allow me to create areas of denial. The only thing is infiltrating Nurgling units. I mean, you don't have to spam units to just stop yourself being alpha struck, but if you can... That's my point. you lots of points, then... Yeah, my, my Nurgling you know, unit is 80 points, and if it means I get an entire flank that doesn't get struck when I, when I didn't want it to, then that's fine, and, you know, that's... Yeah, because it's like so much stuff now can get a turn one charge. Yes. Like, anything that deep strikes, Gene Steelers with their can use a command point or two command points. Like move twice, advance and charge. Uh, they double the advance uh, roll. Yeah, and they and can still they can charge, charge after. Because they're Gene Steelers, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but so like, my point is that it's not that take it, you shouldn't have to take um, anti alpha strike units, but when it gets to instances where. It feels like I have to make accommodations in my list for it. Not okay. It might be cheap. I might spend you know a hundred to two hundred points total on things intended to stop Alpha Strike, but I almost feel like I can't afford to turn up without those units. I would not play my guard without the Sentinels. I would not play my Demons without the Nurglings. Uh, it it seems problematic to me the fact that that speaks to how strong the Alpha Strike technique is. I mean. It's good that Chapter Approved previewed that they are going to do the roll. You get plus one if you deploy first. Now, I think that is what was needed rather than just automatically choosing because you could literally build your army in a way to make sure you went first. Like, my guard is the Skions um, with some mounted Chimeras. I run Vendettas and I've got them from... The last edition when they used to be in the book, but I still sort of use them. Um, I've got four Chimeras, and then obviously every unit of Skions can deep strike. So I could literally choose if I wanted to go first or not, because I could deploy everything in four Chimeras and two Vendettas down to, and then I think put in two units minimum in deep strike, or I could go up to put in 
I deploy everything on the board and nothing in tanks to make sure I didn't go first if I wanted to. And that was literally what it came down to. Whereas, by comparison, my guard list that regularly includes, you know, 30 odd units would never previously have had the opportunity to go first in that matchup. So that is a very big and important change that's going to be coming in with chapter approved. I mean, we're already playing it. We we pretty much felt like that was how we wanted to be doing it anyway. Um, it felt like a not so much fairer, but it just added more variance to games because that that in game rule change massively impacts army building. Yes, it does, and it it means it has led to more varied um, army lists. I know, yeah. Now, when Which I start building an army list, I just put in what I want now and don't even consider who, if I go above sort of seven or ten units, I'm not, I could be give, just giving turn one to my opponent. So, therefore, if I'm just giving my opponent turn one all the time, I need to just inevitably make sure that my army can weather all the firepower. Yeah. Um, Whereas now you go, mm, I don't necessarily need to do that. I can work it out when I sit down against my opponent and just go from there. It did feel strange to me that whenever I sat down across the table from an opponent with my guard, I knew I'd be going second. It's like, if I want to play this army, I am never going first. And it felt weird to think, I'm now playing a, an entire edition of 40k where I never go first to this army. I never get to fire with my Basilisks and my Lehman Russes before I get shot at. I never get to do 100% uh, firepower. Now, in a game, that's fine. You know, if you look at it as a single game and go, oh, in this game I didn't get to fire everything unharmed, that's fine, because the next game I might do. But in a world where that wasn't the case, it felt weird to think that I never would fire all my weapons un uninjured. Oh, like my tower, where it basically went first every single game, and was that devastating that it's like, wow, so turn one's just like a couple of my opponent. Now, one of the reasons... And there isn't even... And doing that, I did it even... I didn't feel good about myself. No. Uh, you so felt my like opponent deployed all the models then within half an hour I'm telling them to take them all off. Yeah, it's almost like why did your opponent bother showing up? Yeah, cheers pal, I just wanted to turn up so I could um, see how many models I could make it take off in a turn. I thought that would be really interactive. As you sort of alluded to earlier when you are saying you've always been an Alpha Strike player, sort of like predating it as a thing in 8th edition... That's because you've played armies such as, you know, drop podding Death Watch, um, entire formation dropping Tau lists and so on. In, in As a playgroup, it's nothing new to us. We're used to having that sort of experience. However, this is where I feel 8th edition raises the question of if Alpha Strike is too strong or too influencing on the way the game plays. Because now... It feels like it's that every game. It doesn't matter who I sit down against or what army they're playing. It feels like one player is in some way going to be initiating an alpha strike against another. And that wasn't the case in 7th. It regularly felt like there was some kind of slog involved across the table. Whether it be flying your flying units, turn 1, but they had to start in the deployment zone and get there. Or whether it was jumping in your wave serpent or rhino rush army and riding across the field. Yeah, you they always seem to feel like there was some level of... You had to get level, there. Yeah, you had to get there. But I've also played against my one of my mates, is Dark, one of his mates, Lewis. He's got a Dark Angel army. Um, he splits it half Deathwing, half Ravenwing. And, you know, one half his army, kind of Alpha Strike. So his Terminators drop in, and are there to do a threat, shoot you up, get to combat if necessary, possible and be a distraction and just get that damage there. But at the same time I was playing my tower and I also had a load of units in Deep Strike that could do an Alpha Strike and I was happy to let in my first turn. I chose to deploy more units than he did. 
Yeah. So then I get this rolls back before we rolled. I was happy to give him turn one. He brought all his Terminators down. I countered by bringing all my battle suits down and wiped all his Terminators out. So my Alpha Strike countered his Alpha Strike. Yeah. And so that game was pretty much decided at the end of my turn one. You know, my half of a force that came down wiped out his half of a force that came down. Now you've got then more he's got to the fight table. through guns with combat guys. And like that's a game where because both players are utilizing alpha strike mechanics, um, there's a bit more of a level playing field to it. But then, give us an example of that game you played against James's Nids, and you were playing with so you know, playing a Fukdar with, army. Yeah, a bit more of a flavorful army. You know, new codex. You've heard me before in the previous videos say I'd wear Serpent Army, I've got more to that, it's got stale. It, I've played it for the past probably eight years or however long. So I thought I'm going to an Aspect Army, so. Caught the Unking. Every Af Aspect Shrine, Caught the Unking style avatar, got a couple of Wraith Lords in there, you know, really yeah. sort of. More flavoured than powered, really, and I play against Tyranids. Um, and my opponent goes first because I deploy way more units than him, so he gets plus one to the dice roll, which we're doing. He beat me on the dice roll, fair dues, fair play, yeah, that's great. And then brings up two Morlocks, drops down three Hive Tyrants, gets a turn one charge of Gene Stealers. And I was literally bucketing my army back into the case. And how fun was that for you? Well, I, I think I'd lost the will to live. Um, <laughs> but then I sort of came back around and thought, right, you know, let's see what I can pull back from this. Let's see what I can take with me, you know, and let's see what... I mean, don't get me wrong, I I put units using Webway portal because I knew I was going to get a lot of pain. So I had to have some countering, and I think that's what you've got to do now. You've got to have dedicated units that you know what are going to do a job. Um, that, that and you've also got to have counter units. That's my point from earlier, is that even though you're doing a relatively, you know, themed Court of the Unking army, here's all the Aspect Warriors on the table, you still need to include some uh, beta striking units or and stuff to yeah, hold back. something that really sort of... Uh, I found with doing that is you kind of can't rely on your deep strikers to beat your opponent's deep strikers because like his Morlocks, his Morlocks can pop up with an inch of me. I then can't deep strike within nine inches of that. So I'm just then struggling. So he moves his wave of men up. So in my deployment zone, he's got three firants, a squad of like 20 gene stealers, and two Morlocks, and then I'm trying to bring my guys back down in my deployment zone to counter what's there, and suddenly I ain't got a lot of room. So then it's pushing me out of my deployment zone into the second wave of tunings that are coming. And that's the kind of thing that I, I hearken back to my issue with demonic summoning, is although it, it works as a mechanic for summoning units, it seems to do very little on the battlefield, because there's nowhere to summon. No, because the uh, the battlefield and is you don't too... know what you're going to summon even that right I think there's enough variance in units and the powerpoint system to bring down some something useful relevant. yes yeah, to bring yeah, down yeah, something yeah. relevant I don't think that's too much of an issue it's just the points that you don't even have to deploy well, for I mean therefore you can end up wasting points uh, the big argument with saving points for reinforcements is you end up with less command points because you fill out less force org charts Oh yeah, that, fair point. Never thought of that. Yeah. Because you're you, you're you not spending five hundred points yeah. to your army. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never thought of that. There's an argument about that with it, but no. I, as a whole, I think reinforcement points for it is okay as a system. I don't think it's too bad. Um, the summoning something sort of random, but not again. I think works and isn't too deliberating. The issue is you not being able to summon just anywhere on the field, having to stay within twelve inches of the summoner. Because that summoner often has enemy units around him in some way, even if they're nine inches away, that means you basically can't I mean, summon you anything. Think, and he can't move, can they? No. I mean, even if they increase the, the bubble, say, to a 36-inch bubble, 
you know, that, that's it, it a lot helped. better. It's in, almost giving you the full vein of deep strike, but not. Yeah, in a world where practically if every army... If you put someone down with 36 inches, but more than 9 inches away from your enemy, you basically got deep strikers. Basically. And it just seems very weird to me that in a world where nearly every army has such ready access to units that can just land anywhere on the field... And as well, the things that can summon, you want moving. Yes. Oh, he was just bloodthirsted to so I went, oh, well. <laughs> yep. Tell me about it. this herald to summon? Oh, wait, no, he's got a six-inch bubble and he needs to follow them guys that have been moving up. Well, I can imagine now is there being um, a stratagem that allows you to summon anywhere on the battlefield. Basically, you use a you use a stratagem where you just summon without a summoner, so you don't. Yes, need... yes. Yeah, so and you get to bring that anywhere on the battlefield. Yeah, because there's no summoner, you're not going to suffer mortal wounds on someone. You don't have to not have Could someone. Be like move. then, so one command point, you get to summon one squad. So you've already, you know, so you're burning a command point, and then you you've still got to roll the dice and see what you can summon. <laughs> It'll just and be then something. For three command points, you can summon two units. Or um, it might be one of those staged ones where for one command point you can summon something up to power level 5, for two command points summon something up to power level 10, and so on. Yeah. That could be a way of doing it. But basically, it'd just be like, the stratagem would be a warp rift, or something well, yeah, like that. Well, yeah, some armies don't even have the option of alpha striking. But there's very few. That's my sort of point. Like, demons are practically the only one I feel that don't. Nearly everything. Any, any marine army has access to terminators and drop pods. Salt marines. Yep, yeah, like any uh, most Xenos races have some way of doing it. About the <laughs> the only one that doesn't sort of genuinely have a way of doing it is orcs, but they have a makeshift way of doing it with the jump, so the psychic power. Which again, that can be denied. You know, you're only putting one unit over to your opponent's side. But alpha strike yeah. tends to mean you're dropping in a lot of your army is designed to wipe out, and that's yes. One. Now, when you argue stuff like the jump being used on a unit of nine mega knobs, is like that that's an alpha strike move. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas if it's like, oh, I'm just gonna send, you know, twenty shooter boys, then fine, that's a that's a maneuver. That's a that's a, that's a nuisance, you know, that's some that's not the alpha strike move as such. But here's the real one. The one that all players are doing is taking two weird boys and you have them cast um warpath on the unit first. Then jump it. What does Warpath do? Plus one attack. So you cast Warpath on them first. Yeah, because the Orcs get to then... the charge, don't they? Yeah, Orcs get to that anyway. And okay. then, obviously, when you deep strike, you can deep strike any way you want, can't you? So if you deep struck 30 Orc boys, you could de- put them in a big, long line. Basically, so, yeah, matching their battle line. Yes, yeah, you're 9 inch away line. all the way around. 9 inch away all the way around. As long as you roll a 9 push, you could just blanket charge. You could, but you're going to get overwatched by a lot. So, yeah, but it's I mean, only hitting on sixes. Yeah, but it is still painful. And then you've got painful. 30 York boys. And then you just blanket strike. And yeah. if they don't wipe out all your boys and the way you remove your models, you know, you can break coherency and stuff, and then you just tie up a load of units while the rest of the York army moves up. And then you get to do that each turn. So whereas the Orc player isn't literally going turn one, here's everything. You go, turn one, here's a mob, I'm going to teleport to you. Turn two, here's another mob, I'm going to teleport to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even Orcs have a way of doing it. It's just a little uh, unorthodox, which is very characterful for the Orcs. A Dark Eldar, I don't know what Dark Eldar have. Um, Mandrakes can do it. They just appear within nine inches. Uh, you've got your Scourger's Deep Strike. Yep, Scourger's Deep Strike, because they've got wings. It's the, the rule of wings. Uh, Hellions? I can't remember if Hellions can Deep Strike. No, uh, I don't I, know. I think they can, because Skyboards have practically always been the equivalent of jump packs, mechanically. I think Hellions might be able to do it. I'm not, I'm not certain, don't quote me on that one, I don't know, but... Um, but even that, just just those two units, Scourges, Mandrakes, that's two things for starters that the army yeah, has. Yeah, are they alpha strike units? They're not. Not really. Is it a flyrant? No, it's it's no flyrant. Exactly. Why is that thing tougher than seven? <laughs> why, why has it got a falcon? Here? Yeah. The because fal- it needs to do everything, ever. Because it's the hive commander. Now... It's a, it's a big change from previous editions, the fact that being able to deep strike and charge, like that would have been unheard of in 6th or 7th edition. You know, that's the key thing to me. Like, 
7th edition, Tau, were very much still capable of deep striking a big force of battle suits and shooting you. You know, Deathwing was still capable of dropping in and shooting you, and so on. But the fact that you're able to make charge moves off it is the real clincher now. That means that so many armies have access to this kind of technique. And that's why it's very prevailing as a form of gameplay. Now, you play... So, like... It's almost like a game of rock, paper, scissors as to whether or not a game's going to be fun or not. I think that's the key issue here. Um, you and you and Lewis played with two forces that have strong Alpha Strike elements. It was a good game, as such, because there was counter-tactics involved. There was decisions to be Lewis made. Lewis did have fun. Yeah, Lewis himself didn't, because he was, it was a learning experience for him, was that game. But the point is, as army lists, there's an interaction between them both, because they're both trying to be the one yeah. who lands the Alpha Strike correctly. If you've got two players that have built... Um, well, I've, I've played the last three games have been the three scenarios. So, Tau vs. Dark Angels. Alpha Strike vs. Alpha Strike. Then I play... Uh, Nids vs. Eldar with your variety of Eldar. Yeah, so I'm sat there being Alpha Struck. With the army that isn't Alpha Striking and has... To, and as such, takes some elements to prevent the damage, but really, you are suffering. Then I play Dark Angels vs Minotaurs, which is... My Minotaurs have no capability of um, stopping being Alpha Struck. They can just weather a hit. The yeah. Marines, it's mostly Primaris, so... You know, they've got to start doing two wounds on guys before you start losing firepower and that sort of malarkey. Um... And then you have and to then I play somebody else with Imperial uh, Astro Militarum versus my Minotaurs, which neither of us um, Alpha Strike, and you've got Alpha Strike counterability, which also gives you some flexibility for playing me. But it's and I've not... just got a bit of durability. Yeah, so all that's happening so is you're being all, durable to the low number of guns I have on the table initially because I'm holding guns off the table to avoid being alpha struck. That isn't happening. And what I've found out of playing all them games, I mean, yeah, I mean, so, don't play my space brains. Of those four games, rate them now as the favorite to least favorite as the four games. So my favorite. Would probably be the game that we had. That was very slug first, pulling myself back from, you know, being behind. So the guard v minotaurs with no real alpha strike elements for either army being the most enjoyable game. Yeah, the second enjoy most enjoyable game would be the. Space Marines again versus the Dark Angels. So being Alpha Struck and using sort an of army. knowing I'm gonna be and sort of being prepared for that and setting up my defence accordingly and then countering that at strike. Yep. With the way I set up and the way You've built your list. Yeah. Third most enjoyable game, Talbot's Dark Angels. Um, there was also en enough going on in the army where you know, some deep strikers came down and dancing around and carrying each other and what have you. The thing that sort of took it away from me was when you realise, obviously, when you play an alpha strike list, you expect to do a lot of damage. But when you literally, like we all play friends, but when you're literally looking up from the board and you just see the other person not having fun, it, it takes away your fun and you're kind of like... Yeah, what, what what am I actually achieving here? Am I actually wanting to smash my opponent into the dust or am I wanting to have a decent game with a friend? And then the last game was where I got smashed into dust by a friend. <laughs> because and that was not You were fighting an alpha striking army with a army that wasn't It remotely set up for, a, for a defending striking itself, or isn't? defending. Really. Yeah. You know, no, some psychic defense that, that just gets removed, got removed real easy. You know, mastering six shots against toughness three, and just all that, just like everything just wrapped up to be against me in every situation. The one thing that good that came out of that game is the Avatar Kane is a boss. <laughs> so, 
Just to analyse that for a second then, it's interesting that... I rate the two Alpha Strike games as bottom of the four games. Yes, and yet, the third tier choice, where it was the two Alpha Strike lists playing each other, still had some level of enjoyability to it. It wasn't a, this was a terrible game and I didn't want to play it. But one opponent, it seems, was definitely not enjoying the match as the as one other. And it was there was still a very tactical edge of gameplay to it, but despite the fact it balanced as gameplay, it had less of enjoyment. But I mean, out of all them four games, there was only one match which had no element of Alstrike. Yeah. Which is like, wow, that, that's such a big thing of the game now. And that's the key it, it, issue. That, and, that, and that's where it comes back to it's... Is be it too defining? Uh, or be prepared to be alpha struck. Yes, and is that healthy for the game or not? We're not sure. Like, you know, please leave some comments and say what, yeah, give what, us your how, how you feel on it, what your opinion is. The key takeaway here is we're not debating the power level of Alpha Strike. It's, it's, it is definitely a powerful thing to be doing. It's a powerful technique. But if, should the outcome of a potential game that can have seven turns be decided after one turn where you potentially haven't even had a go? Yeah. You know, should the outcome of the game really be decided after only half of a turn? You know, if you if you say there's seven game length, game turn lengths, so there's fourteen player turns, like you have turn one, then I sort of have a player turn two, and so on. Should a game really be decided at the end of player turn, turn one? one? Yeah. It, you know. Would you sit down and play Monopoly after your first dice roll decided if you're going to win or not? What what other game would you play where the outcome was decided in the first sort yeah, of section we, of the game? Ultimately, we don't want forty k becoming chess, where after the first four moves you can predict in how many moves you're going to now beat the opponent. You know, yeah. it's like oh, after the first turn, I can tell that I'm going to defeat you in the next two turns or the next turn. Yeah. You know, it's not yes, what we there want. is some element of there's dice involved, but you know you can really you can put the dice in your favour. The game we had last month with your tower versus my guard was one of the few games I think recently where all the way up until the end of game turn two, it still was not clear who was in the lead. We'd done damage to each other, but in no clear significant way. There to... was no significant. We ended the game with three models on the table. We, we were giving as what good as we mine, got. One two was yours. And the victory points were what? Like one or two points in it. I can't remember. Yeah, it was close. So it was everything to play for for the seven turns of the game. And it was brilliant. It was. Not, oh look, um, Not, after oh, two look, turns... I'm going to drop my 2,000 point force into your 2,000 point force. Wreck me that much that I've just destroyed 1,000 points of your army. Good luck. Yeah. Now, basically, after deployment, you're playing a thousand point army versus two thousand points. You're never gonna win. You're not. You're not gonna win with a thousand points versus two if you took that much of a loss. You know. And then you're there's also the element of with alpha strike. You're pinned in your table edge. You're pinned in where you were. You know. You haven't got that maneuverability to move out, get them other objectives. You know. Cause. Obviously, your opponent who's alpha striking, you still got had to deploy high, at least half his force on the table, so that ends up being like their wave two. So yep. they alpha strike you, keep you distracted with them alpha strike units, and then everything else that deployed runs around, grabs objectives, puts in the firepower, or once you've finally dealt with the alpha strike stuff, then comes in as like right now you've got to deal with us, or you didn't deal with the alpha strike units in time. Now we're on top of you. It. It's a very strong tactic, and I think it's potentially too strong. Yeah, I think it may perhaps be warping how the game is played is the issue. It's not whether or not those things in themselves are too strong, but whether or not that side of the gameplay... It, it turns the game too much into, did I bring the right army to play this game, or is this now just a formality that I'm 
taking models off the table when my opponent asks me to. Yeah, you don't want to be. I I don't want Warhammer to get to the position where you literally your friend likes a list. He's like, oh, I've read this cool list. It's some you know that I, I want to play, and then I just go and there's literally no point me playing you. Yeah, it's cool as that list is, mate. There's probably no point in asking me. I'll play it. Yeah, no, sure, I'll play it, but it's not going to be enjoyable. And I know you're going to win from the outset. I'm going to try and win because <laughs> that's what the game's about. But pretty much, I know I'm, you know. So perhaps to close off this segment, I think um, our verdict is probably that Alpha Strike is too strong a technique unless both players are playing it and in which case it's a bit more of a oh. a balanced thing but unless you can set up a good defense yeah <laughs> and again terrain comes into it and there's a, it's easier to be the attacker than the defender yeah that, that's a small point definitely to worth mentioning is i think terrain plays a big role in how effective alpha strikes are and I think tournament scenes. I understand why this is the case for event organizers and so on. I don't. Th- I don't think tournament tables play with enough terrain for this edition of Forty K. No, you need the line of sight looking stuff. As cool as it is to have a load of nice windows and buildings and get stuff looking nice, then you might as well basically play with no terrain. <laughs> yeah. For some of the purpose of what the terrain does, yes, it gives some of your models a plus one cover save. But for all intents and purposes, you might as well not play with terrain. You might as well just set up on an open board and go, right, we're playing in no man's land. Yep, I can shoot you, you can shoot me. Who gets to shoot first? That's the important role. Yeah. But one thing we are looking at doing in the future, now it might be a long time away, it might be within the next 12 months, we're hoping to get some games up on the channel. Yeah, the, the format might be a little undecided initially, but that's definitely something that we were looking to get um, up and running within the next six or 12 months, <laughs> for definite, you know. We hope we're trying to get stuff painted, we, terrain and armies. Um, we, we'd, we'd like to share with you our experience of the hobby as well, you know. We don't just want to come across as people who brag on tournament scenes because it's not how we play. Well, we'd like to share how we play, you know. Yeah, definitely. We, we, we enjoy it I and we like think there are those of you out there. I other people's games while I paint and model. So, you know, it'd be good to, to give some of back to other people that paint and model. And it's, it's another way it's of sharing inspiring. and engaging in the hobby. It's inspiring. I find watching other people play on painted tables with fully painted armies inspiring for me to do the same. Yep. I totally it, agree. It, it sort of shames me into painting. <laughs> When you see some of the a nice battlefield and nice models on it, you know, rather than gray, a sea of grey plastic. So, we'll move on to um, a certainly a more enjoyable segment, um, one of our favourite uh, segments on the podcast that we do every month, and that is favourite moments, favourite war stories, and um, those glorious little moments when things just go right against the odds. At one time... Uh- on Warhammer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my dreadnought playing the Dark Angels where Bile cut out my warlord's head from his armour. <laughs> just in one you know, fell because As, I, I as he's tending to do. Uh, five three up saves to make using the Indomitable's armour and I fell three and just each died. Um, <laughs> so then my dreadnought proceeded to Laz Cannon Bile in the face Charge is Terminator Ancient, so he just power fisted him straight in the face. And then the next turn, Laz Cannon Samael and killed him. So he just went, oh, there's like 3 HQ and they're all dead. He's like, oh, you're, you're currently the company uh, commanders of these uh, these companies, are you? Well, I'm a Dreadnought, I'm an Ancient. I've been around for longer than you two, kind of. <laughs> You think you know some stuff? Well, take last canvas to the face. And he wanted some redemption because some male killed his mate. <laughs> it's like, no, I'd known him for years. Literally centuries of warfare with my best bud and you killed him. You killed Donald. 
So yeah, th- yeah, that's probably my best moment from recently. My dreadnought that just saw <laughs> red and was cannon everything that moved. <laughs> Take it out both Samael and Boyle. And Boyle with last cannon. Me and Boyle were the best one. One last cannon hit got straight through and I rolled that glorious six. Can Can you imagine the like sergeant had to report back to Azriel? After that battle report. Well, he had one biker sergeant that survived the game. So that one Raven guy guy has to go back to Azrael and go, so both the second captain and the first captain are dead. Oh, did they die gloriously? No, no, they they, they got both got last cannoned by this one dreadnought. <laughs> it, it, was, it was even calling me out and he's like, uh, so are you going to do anything on her boy and, you know, why like, assault the dreadnought into Bio or somewhere I might know. Nope, last cannon. Last cannon you. <laughs> and then if you survive, I'll like, charge you with the dreadnought. Hmm. <laughs> Boyle just died instantly. I was too busy gloating about killing my warlord in hand to hand combat, and I was never been beaten in hand to hand combat, so I was kind of doing. <laughs> so, oh, you're so great in close to con- co- uh, close quarter combat. Well, you know what? I think I'm not gonna do engaging in close quarter combat. <laughs> so, take these last cannons to the face. Well, well that other guy who stood behind you with that big banner who isn't gloating about how good he is in combat, I just squish him with my fist. <laughs> By the way, it's venerable dreadnought. Yeah, I, I, well, you would be at this point. <laughs> Doesn't matter what else he'd done in his career up until that point. That, <laughs> that makes him venerable. Yeah, he's hurt his stripes. <laughs> and the cool thing was, that was the first game after I'd fully painted him. Oh, see, it actually felt rewarding sort of thing. It's like, yeah, look, he's now finished painted and he performed well. Yeah, definitely. And his mate, like, did nothing. That was the guy that's, like, kind of needs a bit of repair doing to him and a bit of a bit of TLC. He's <laughs> been, um... It's, it's in better days. It's nice when Karma feels like it's rewarding you for painting your models. Yeah. Um, my my favourite moment recently was playing Joel's Ultramarines. And it was the first time in this edition, um, believe it or not, that I've had to play Gulliman. First time I've actually crossed the table from him, and you know that's because we've not all immediately jumped on the ridiculously powerful over the top Primax or anything like that. Because you know why would we as our playgroup? But that aside, just want Gulliman to the field. Great calls. Like I never played against the Primark before, and I've never played against Gulliman in particular. So I was like, what should we do? And I went with the uh, traditional technique I use with my guard of I ignored the big intimidating thing. I concentrated on your objective, I concentrated on dealing damage where it would actually um, inflict damage and actually kill things and reduce firepower, and I left Gulliman just roaming around in the middle of the field of his honor guard. I wasn't going to engage him, I didn't need to. Um, so eventually, like four or five turns into the game, Gulliman's made his way over to what's left of my line at this point, which is most of my command structure. You know, the various infantry have died off. Um... So it's the first game turn where we get the opportunity to actually shoot Gulliman after we've dropped the remaining veterans that were with him. So yeah, so Gull- we finally actually opened up on Gulliman and it was pretty much opportunity fire because there was nothing much else worth firing at at this point. And that turn I had rolled up um, an objective to kill an enemy character with one of my characters. So Gulliman was pretty much the only viable target. And my plan was to complete it with my tank commander, because he's a character, so I was just going to vanquish him in the face. <laughs> like, such an honourable duel! And in the end, basically, Gulliman uh, was left on one wound after my turn. He wasn't down, he'd had to burn uh, command rerolls to save him and so on. Um, but passing back to Joel's turn, Gulliman was able to sort of wade in a little bit. As tends to happen with my army, one skull of assaulted one of my characters in the command uh, like area. <laughs> About the five other guard characters that are stood nearby, all heroically intervened and just sort of leapt on him. Gulliman just ended up completely gutting Dead Dog, who was guarding the commander, and in return, uh, my simple company commander with a power sword, nothing fancy actually put the final wound on Gulliman and dropped him. I wasn't expecting it to happen and it was amazing that it went through because all I could see in my head was Gulliman had come wading in trying to behead my commander and Dead Dog had literally leapt on him to his death. Like Dead Dog had been flailing away and peeled himself on his sword and he gets to fight when he dies in the combat phase. So even though he got killed by Gulliman he got to fight and he didn't do anything. 
But he's doing damage, but he got to fight. So in my mind, it felt like Dead Dog had literally sort of like dragged Gulliman to the floor uh, while he was dying. So Gulliman wasn't expecting him. He just like gutted him with the sword and moving on. And then he just leapt on him. He's like, you know, what's he doing? He thought he was dead. And while he's been like pinned on the floor by the ogre, my commander's just walked over and stuck his sword through his uh, like helmet lens. <laughs> That's one thing though that I want I want to see if they can address because just like the nature of guard, you end up with loads of characters and stuff, and they end up tending to migrate together. Yeah. So therefore, you might have five characters stood basically within unit coherency with each other. Why would my army ignore them as being a squad? Why would I not be able to target them? I, f- I feel somewhere there should be a rule that if you have so many characters within so many inches, I don't know how you do the right wording for whatever, but you should then be able to target them. Squads, cluster- characters clustering, and just going, yeah, you can't target us. Even though there's basically five of us here and it look like we're a squad, you just ignore us. What I think it needs to be is other characters don't count towards the character targeting rule so if if effectively in a conga line stood behind each other you had characters a b and c and then an infantry squad at the back you can shoot the first character because he's the closest target and you can shoot the infantry squad at the back because they're an infantry squad they're not characters but you can't shoot the two characters in the middle because there's something closer than them yeah However, in that scenario, if characters didn't count towards... You could shoot any of the three characters and the squad. Yes. Because... Yeah, and that, I think that would be better because as well you also end up with like mini characters protecting bigger characters behind... So you get like a squad. So you might have like a squad of ten guardsmen, then a primary, then a, a sanctioned psyker or a weird vein psyker. And then your primary psyker. So I've got to kill the squad and then the weird vein psyker to get to the primary psyker. And it's like, mm, I'm pretty sure that you'd be able to, you know, target characters if, you know, like you say, they're closer to you than a squad of 10 men is. Like if there's a squad of 10 men in front of you and there's two men stuck behind it, yeah, I get that they're just going to blend in together. If there's two guys in fancy armour... You know, bellowing orders or seeing, you know, you're gonna be able, they're gonna stand out more than the 10 guys that they're studying from. And then you end up with silly circumstances such as the Eldar Avatar, which we know why, for legacy reasons, because of the scale of the model that's not been changed in 20 years compared to the same scale models it stands next to, it's an eight wound model. See, it's, I know we don't really touch on rumours, but I have seen a rumour that the uh, the Avatar is getting a new plastic model to scale it to actual Demon Prince level. Yeah. New Games Workshop Demon Prince level. Big guy model. Sort of, kind of Primark level. Yeah. Like the Loyalist Primark level. Which, if... Which would then is going to change its rules. It'll come with updated data sheets. Um, so to on. bring its rules up to being able to be targeted, apparently. Like, from what, yeah, from what I've heard, more to the lines of the Hive Tyrant on 12 wounds. Yeah. Because that would make more sense. Like It's a big flaming monstrosity. The yeah, the that, over elves, which looks nothing like the other things around it. Because there's some argument for the hive tyrant is a big towering monstrosity in an army with big towering monstrosities. You can target the hive tyrant though; it's got twelve wounds. A kind of fixed then. If there was a if, for example, if it was a character, it's, a, uh, it's got eight wounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, for example, uh, old one eye I assume was a character and um, will have eight wounds. I don't know, but. You know, he could be an example of, you know, he's a counterfix roaming around with a bunch of other counterfixes. So you might not inherently identify which one he is. But yeah, the um the Eldar Avatar the Eldar the God of the Demon, Avatar of Death Demon, and War and Destruction. Demon princes. Yes, I do think Demon Princes are a little odd. Like the mm, what big, great big Nurgle Demon Prince with wings. Does he stand out more than them Death Guard? Yes. He's got big monstrous wings. No, because as he doesn't, we've discussed this. No Nurgle Demon Prince has big monstrous demonic wings. Everyone you ever see has piddly, tiny, little flappy things 
built on its back just so it okay. counts as a winged demon prince. So... <laughs> I know what you're getting at, yeah, but... Yeah, but you don't see any other demon prince. You'll never see Nurgle. <laughs> um, but, all these issues might soon be getting addressed. Um, so, just in case you've been living under a rock at all, you know, for the last month, um, Chapter Approved is back. Something that's always sort of been somewhere throughout the workshop's history, and its latest reincarnation is as the annual... Um, update to Warhammer 40,000. So, in a similar vein to the General's Handbook from Age of Sigma, it's intended to be an annual release at the end of every year in which they address updates to the game, they listen supposedly to the community, take on board um, suggestions from event organisers and all sorts, and basically it's an opportunity to tweak and amend elements of the game and hopefully you know improve it as the uh, as we the players uh, hope it will be improved I mean, we touched on chapter approved earlier didn't we with the plus one for the deployment and stuff yes released a early preview sort of basically saying yeah we, 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 we'll kind of like people to start doing this now, now. It, it's there this is what we're thinking of doing and we're pre-warning you but if you'd like to start doing it, because we realise that just automatically giving a player the first turn is a bit powerful. <laughs> it's a bit too defining, you know, it, it limits uh, variability, it makes games repetitive, and this change is going to change that. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's like now, like if I played you with my Space Marines, like with the old rules... Oh, my guard would never get to go first against anything. Yeah, and how ever. boring would that be? So every time I sit down to play, or every time we put models on the table to play, I always go first. Yep. I would be taking lists where I, I end up having to buy uh, two or three things of everything minimal because I don't expect things to survive. Because they're always going to get shot. I never, I would never have had a situation where they don't Whereas get now, shot. now, next time we play... Um, that yes, storm raven might be to, flying down the table. Yeah, I get plus one to the dice roll. I could roll a one and get a two. You could roll a five and go first again. But then I could steal the initiative off you. You know, it it, it isn't just he who deploys first goes first. Um, no, and that's uh... and that's if that's just one of the small rules that's gonna. If that's just an insight of some of the stuff that they're gonna address. I'm all for chops approved. I'm looking forward to it. They're going to address um, factions that don't have a codex yet. Are getting um, yes. a couple of relics. They're getting some warlord some traits. Couple of stratagems, warlord traits. Just something to step you up the mark a bit from just having nothing. Yeah. Uh, last month we were talking about the big difference between playing an index army versus playing a codex army, and, and that that step's kind of been addressed, which is good. And, yes. You know, that, that, that's good. Chapter approved is going to be uh, definitely reducing that gap between those and it's index like armies. Pound, you know, so it's not back breaking if they're going to do it every year. Now the first one might be twenty pound. Then after that, it might be like twelve pound, like the indexes were or whatever or. You know, it, it, it might not be as much no, because it seems, it's literally just the first one. It seems like there's going to be a good chunk of content in it as well. It's coming with rules for Planet Strike, Stronghold Assault, like Apocalypse. The rule book was the narrative to give you the new 40k and the very basic rules, and chapter approved is going to be, and here is the advanced rule section. Yes, and that's a trend that they've been um, repeating recently in a lot of their supplemental products. They've done that with Blood Bowl, they're doing it with Necromunda. Blood Bowl, like, um, here's the Blood Bowl rules, but then you've also got uh, Death Zone Season 1, Death Zone Season 2. Necromunda is doing Gang War Season 1, I Season think, 2. I think it works, you know. Yeah, makes them more money. <laughs> Whatever. That's well, why we got the rule book in the in starter set, rather than a little handbook that we've always had. But then you're also drip-feeding rules to people, and, you know, people remember them then. Yeah. You know, everyone knows the basic rules now. If I went to you, here's 78 pages of rules, you know, I, I'm i nearly 10 games in now, probably more than 10 games into the new 40k, but after the first game I played, I felt like I knew the rules. Yeah. I mean, I do think it's interesting, 
the chapter approved is probably in fact it is it's going to have more rules in it than the rule book has rules yeah <laughs> yeah they're even giving us six new maelstrom missions six new eternal war missions and so on they're giving us just as much content as there was in the original giving us, um, new maelstrom missions and stuff that's going to be cool Yep, there's six new Eternal War missions and six new Maelstrom of War missions. Sick. You know, that's just what they've previewed is going to be in the book, whereas we will no doubt have our hands on it this time next week and we'll be able to have a more in-depth look at it. So yeah, guys, let us know for definite your thoughts down in the comments. We'd love to know your opinions on Alpha Striking, um, your thoughts about the upcoming chapter approved. And as always, we'd love to hear about any um, favourite moments any of you guys have had recently in 8th edition. And next month, or possibly in the next few weeks, we will may even have a bonus episode discussing some of the upcoming changes in Chapter Approved. Um, I am, in, all, in all honesty, I am happy to get as mu much more content out as we can, so I'm not going to turn down opportunities to you know, do this more regularly. We're definitely going to be turning this into a regular monthly thing. So, um, thanks for coming out, guys. Thanks for listening. If you did enjoy the podcast, then definitely don't forget to give it a like. Subscribe to the channel for more content like this. So, as well as monthly podcasts, I have weekly Let's Plays going up on the channel. And amongst other things, uh, there's plenty of stuff to go check out. So, definitely do that. Leave your thoughts and comments below. And we will see you next time, guys. Yeah, see you later. Take care.